This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the Healthy Happens Here series, a series of virtual webinars that cover a variety of health topics, including nutrition, mental health, tobacco cessation, and chronic disease self-management. So welcome, everybody. Thank you again for joining us. And to share, I'm Candace Schottenlor, a health educator with the Community Engagement Team with the Florida Department of Health here in Miami-Dade County. And today I also have my colleague, Brianna McDaniel, who will be assisting today in today's webinar. And so today's event is called Perennial Edibles Gardening, Easy to Grow Vegetables and Fruits that You Can Grow All Year. And so during this webinar, we will have a presentation to learn from a local gardener on growing your own perennial edible gardens in Miami-Dade County throughout the whole year. And you also learn more about the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program from the University of Florida, which was created in 1993, as homeowners were identified through research as being responsible for 60% of non-source pollution from fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicide usage, and used proportionately higher volumes of water in their homes, landscapes as well. And so the program uses nine principles to guide all in how to maintain their landscape gardens in an environmentally friendly and sustainable way. And so you'll learn more about this today. And in addition, we'll have a Q&A session later on with our presenter immediately following the presentation. And so please feel free at any time to enter your questions in the chat box and we'll address those during the Q&A. And just a few other reminders, um, you have the capability to have your cameras on and off and also to uh, mute and unmute your microphones. And just a friendly reminder, if you're not speaking, to please have your microphones muted at this time. Thank you so much. And now I would like to introduce Brianna McDaniel, a health educator with the community engagement team here in Florida Department of Health in Miami-Dade County to share some important information on nutrition and the importance of physical activity as it relates to gardening. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Candice. Um, just like she mentioned, I'm just gonna quickly cover some nutrition information. And the first thing I want to note is that fruit and vegetables whole grains and lean proteins make up a very healthy plate. So as you can see from this image, fruits and vegetables should make up half of your plate. So this includes those this that are fresh. Frozen. Um, the physical activity recommendations for adults is generally two hours and 30 minutes or more of activity a week. And that requires moderate guys, effort yeah. and gardening. Um, I apologize. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> My apologies. Um, so the next thing we're gonna quickly talk about 
is gardening and your health. So as Candice mentioned earlier today, we're going to be talking about gardening in South Florida. And we have a great speaker. Um, so there are several benefits as it combines physical activity, mindfulness, and when all is done and finish a healthy and balanced diet. So on this slide, we have a quick excerpt from the Journal of Clinical Medicine and how gardening is a great activity for all aspects of your life. And that's ranging from sunlight and vitamin D to strength building and intense exercise. So that actually brings us to our guest speaker. So our guest speaker for today's Healthy Happens Here webinar is Barbara McAdam. Since 2005, she's been the first in South Florida. Um, uh, the IFAS Extension Service of Miami-Dade. So after completing the Master Gardener program, she realized that the Extension Service is throughout the entire US. So this was a way for her to serve the public and protect the environment. Ever since she's been gardening, she also shares with her sister and she also shares her sister and her grew up with her grandmother and planted in the backyard and vegetables every year, providing whole healthy fresh food and also raised chickens as well. Her passions are in planting for pollinators. Without them, we would not help have healthy fruits, vegetables, and nuts that should be part of our diets. And of course, all things pertaining to conserving and protecting the quality of our water resources. So I will now turn it over to Ms. Barbara McAdam. Hi, I forgot that I shared so much information about myself. Um, so if I can, oh, there we go, screen share. We're gonna go ahead and get started. And there you go. There's some of the fruits and vegetables. We're going to talk about the easier ones to grow and the ones that I love that are perennial and will just really grow well through our really hot, wet summers here in South Florida. So here's my information again. And I was going to explain my grandmother had a white cat, and this could have been cabbages from our garden that I grew up. Uh, we planted the whole yard as soon as um, in North Florida, as soon as any danger of frost was over. So the gardening seasons were were reversed from what we do down here. But I do want to encourage you to visit our website, and you'll see that information again. And plus, you will all have a PDF where all of the hyperlinks will be hot. So any questions that don't get answered today, please shoot me an email. So here's the list that we're gonna be going over today, some of the simple ones. And I know I just had a question this morning from someone asking me about growing some of the um, Chinese, uh, Asian vegetables, and there are some already included in this presentation. So let's get started. Now, this is an old one. Um, this is pigeon peas. And we know that peas for, are healthy. They contain protein and that peas and rice together are a complete protein. Pigeon peas have been grown for over 3,500 years. They're originally from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. This will grow as a beautiful shrub but it won't produce the peas all year. They are still going to need the shorter days of, of winter, and then they will flower and produce the, the peas. But they are very drought tolerant, and they can also grow in wet areas. And that's quite an interesting mix, because usually plants will like it dry or they will like it wetter. And since it is a legume, it will fix nitrogen. And um, you can... Um, grow more from the, the seeds and you can also plant any seeds that are untreated. So if you find a bag of pigeon peas, dried pigeon peas, you could buy that in the grocery store and, and sprout them and plant them. More information, I'm gonna always link you to different uh, websites for more information for you to explore because we don't wanna be here all day, right? <laughs> so next is uh, cassava or yucca. And this is not something that you can buy the, just buy the, the fruit or the vegetable in the grocery store and plant. This is a plant that actually grows from the stalks, not from the root tuber. So this is 10,000 years old we've been, since we've been eating this. And it originated in Brazil. And of course it migrated all around the world. It's now the third largest source of carbohydrates 
crops grown in the world. Um, it's perennial. It'll keep growing and producing larger and larger root tubers. However, you do have to um, uproot it or figure out a way to harvest part of the roots. And it should be known that not all varieties are, are edible. Some are very high in cyanide. So you want to, um, if you're going to acquire this plant, you would be getting that from someone who's growing an edible variety. And I'll answer questions about how you can get some of these things um, at the end of the presentations. So this is one of my favorites. This is wing beans, and this is Asian. And this vine, this, this bean grows on a vine that will grow all year long. You could build a trellis and this vine will just cover it and can have a nice shady place to sit in the summer. And when we get to short days again, it will produce these beautiful blue pea flowers. They're a gorgeous shade of blue. And then they'll start developing the wing beans. Now um, you can eat these when they're small, they're tender, or you can wait until they're, they're larger, mature, and you can slice them. There's lots of ways to eat this. If you want to know more, just explore it on the internet or ask one of your Asian friends and they'll have tons of recipes for this. You can also cook the peas um, or the beans that are inside those green pods. And the way we grow this, the way I acquired it is from a seed pod from the fruit and spice part. So you can buy seeds uh, at any of the big box stores for this plant. You can find it on the internet as well. Um, and also with pea plants, you can, legumes, you can eat the flowers and some of the stems and, and stalks are edible as well. But um, you wanna double check that. And I already put this in here, but I got a little note from Brianna this morning asking about the nutrients. Um, all of these publications, particularly the uh, Wikipedia, probably already lists the USDA nutrient uh, information, but I will also share the, the way you can find this database on your own. So this is one of my absolute favorites, Choyote. Um, it's a crisp, cooling fruit that tastes more like an apple. And you can grow this vine all year long. And Again, it will flower in the short days and it'll be producing these, looks like a clenched fist, um, vegetable or fruit. I, you know, fruits, vegetables are really fruits. They're all considered fruit in the botanical world, in the horticultural world. So forgive me if I'm back and forth on them, but a lot of people will eat this, um, they will cook it like a potato. I prefer it raw. It's crisp and cooling and you can slice it up. It's excellent for eating in salads and you can plant this right in the soil in your yard. It really will grow in, in some pretty poor soil. So actually the yucca will grow in your garden soil. So, I mean, in your landscape soil, so will the, um, I'll go back for a second. Um, so will the pigeon pea, the yucca, um, wing beans, yes, but it might need a little more. It'll grow better if you can um, give it some better soil and maybe add some compost. So Baniato, if you take a drive down here, um, <coughs> excuse me, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Someone who's, who speaks Spanish, um, you can correct me later. Um, but this is growing all over in the fields right now. So this is a tuber. This is just like a sweet potato. It has a smaller vine and it will grow all year. Hang on a second. You can see that it has beautiful purple flowers but we're not interested in those flowers and don't eat those flowers. Um, what you can do is you can harvest part of them. You don't have to pull them all up at one time if you have a larger area where you're growing it. And I would recommend 
not putting this in a raised bed that you want to uh, plant anything else with because it will take over the raised bed. I made that mistake one year and decided, well, that bed's going to be for my, my Cuban sweet potatoes uh, because they were, I could not get them all out. But there are different ways to cook this. I mean, you can treat it as any sort of potato, but we all know that we add salt and butter and all sorts of things to potatoes. But I like it sliced and just baked and then just a little bit of olive oil on the top of it and maybe a smidge of salt. It's delicious. So explore ways to eat these as well as grow them. So you can actually buy the potato in a grocery store and you can plant the whole thing or you can cut it and plant sections of it. Or if you remember way back when, you know, I'm kind of from way back when, we used to always um, cut the top off or the, and the end off of a sweet potato and put the toothpicks around it and just let the bottom of it, the, um, the, the tip of it, this part, touch the water, and that would start to produce roots. And then along the cut part, or do I have it backwards, it would start to produce vine. Or, or plant and we would grow this sweet potato in the, in the kitchen window during the winter, just for fun. But more information on how to produce those vine cuttings um, is available on the website and you can also contact me, but I'm, I'm the lazy gardener. So I'll just stick the whole thing in the ground and let it grow. Maybe pick some smaller ones. Ginger, mm. what doesn't taste better with ginger? And I love Thai food. Oh, I love fall food. <laughs> so ginger, again, just buy the combs in the grocery store. I like the smaller ones because if it's too big, it might not, um, it might rot before it can start to develop uh, roots and, and sprout out. And these little areas right here is where the plant is going, to, the green leaves are going to start to sprout. So this is underground. Again, you would have to pull up. So you would harvest some of it and leave some. And also what it's, what's going to happen here is during the winter, since this is a very tropical plant, the leaves are going to kind of die back. I, mine has almost lost all of its leaves. Now you could say, I could put it in a, a more sunny location, but full sun down here in South Florida is pretty brutal for the whole summer. So if you can find a spot in your garden where it's, you know, maybe you have a tree that's a little less uh, leafy or, you know, the angle of the sun changes as we rotate, our angle changes as we rotate around the sun. So if you could find the perfect spot where this got a little bit of shade, it likes bright shade or filter through uh, through the tree branches best for it to thrive. Um, and maybe if you find that where it's, it's it has those conditions in the summer, but has more sun in the winter, it might stay green. The other benefit to this plant is that the flowers are heavenly to smell. Um, not sure, so do not eat the flowers. I know I may tell you that some flowers are edible. I'm almost hesitant to do that because I don't want everyone to just start randomly gobbling up flowers because some of them are not edible and could make you very sick. Um, but this has a beautiful fragrance to, for you to enjoy. It smells like the um, an S.T. Lauder perfume, um, white linen. It's an older perfume. My mother-in-law used to give it to me. Just absolutely um, wonderful fragrance on this. And then of course, peel and use the raw ginger as you would in any recipe. Now this is uh, not the pink ginger. It's a little bit yellowish. Sunflowers, hmm, well. We happen to have free sunflower seeds from Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department because this is the only plant in those uh, catalogs of things that you can brand with your name to give away. You know, the tchotchkes that um, all of the county departments uh, share with the public. 
This is the only one that will really grow here and it's drought tolerant and it's native and it sunflower seeds are no cholesterol. Um, they're a brain food. They will pump up your, um, they'll energize your brain and it's a great plant for pollinators. Do not eat the seeds in the packets. Those have been stored in a big old warehouse and you know they may have had different things crawling over them. So I've had one young lady open the package and I started talking about once you grow these and you can harvest some of the heads, you could roast these seeds or eat them raw or you could share them with the birds. So this is a great plant for kids, um, big and young and old kids, big and small kids to learn how to plant a seed. There's a universal rule for how deep you plant a seed. And that would be never plant it more than one and a half times the depth of the longest part of the seed. So I would want to plant this seed no more than three quarters of an inch. Otherwise, it will not be prompted by light to, to send down a root and send out its first leaves at the same time, pretty much. So you, although this is not um, a perennial plant, it's an annual, it usually grows, flowers, and then goes into to decline. You can save the seeds and we can grow sunflowers all year long in Miami-Dade County. We actually have huge fields of them growing down here in Homestead. And I see them often when I'm driving up the turnpike and they're grown for the cut flower industry. So this is a win, 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 win. Edible, feeds the pollinators, Birds love the seeds. You can save the seeds and eat them. You can cut the flowers and bring some inside. So keep growing these. There's no reason why you couldn't have sunflowers growing all year long. So pineapples, yes. Now this is probably about the way, the color of a pineapple you would buy in the grocery store. And that's more the color of a pineapple if you harvested it from your home garden. So I'm going to take a moment here to just explain that when you grow these fruits and vegetables in your home gardens, you pick them at their peak ripeness. I don't pick my pineapples until I can walk over and just twist them and they fall. Most of the time, pineapples are cut and they're cut greener so that when they arrive to the grocery store, they won't be too ripe. But nothing is ever going to taste as good as that fresh harvested pineapple that you bring in from your garden that has been warmed by the sun. Mm, delicious. So how to grow a pineapple yourself? That is one of the easiest things in the world to do. You're gonna make a cut about right here. You're gonna leave a little bit of that bottom fleshy part in, and then you're gonna set this aside and let it harden or form a callus for a couple of days. And then you're just going to place it in soil and just scooch the soil around this green base. Now, in the garden where this original pineapple was growing, let's go back to the other page. No, I didn't give you, well, yeah, this is good enough. When this got a longer stem and they cut it, this plant, the mother plant, we'll call her, usually starts to decline. But before she does, she produces what we call some pups or slips or hapas, whatever they call them in, in different languages and the botanical name or horticultural name. I call them pups. Um, you can also let those develop and then gently remove the whole plant and kind of pry those apart and start individual new pineapple plants. And you can also plant this top as your next pineapple plant. So every time you eat one of your pineapples, you're going to be planting another one, which is a good thing because pineapples take 18 to 19 months from starting the plant to actually produce a pineapple. 
Now, a lot of people will say, well, these are smaller. Yes, they are, but they make up for it in a powerful, powerful, sweet taste. Um, and I love this. Be a pineapple, stand tall, wear a crown, and be sweet on the inside. So let's go to leafy vegetables. We all need to eat those. By the way, my grandmother always used to tell me to eat my vegetables. You'll grow up big, strong, and, and I'm five foot 11, or used to be. <laughs> so this is one of my favorites. This is an Asian vegetable. This is a Chinese spinach. It's known as longevity spinach. And if you search longevity spinach on the internet, boy, are you gonna come up with all sorts of um, claims about the powers of this, this vegetable. And someone asked me about medicinal uses. I, I cannot address those. There's too many out there. And as a University of Florida, um, we would not um, talk about anything that's not fully documented and vetted. But this is not a true spinach. And we grew ours from cuttings. The cuttings came from um, the research center that we have here, the Tropical, um, uh, Tropical Research Center, TREC, Tropical Research and Education Center. They were growing this. This is being looked at as an alternative crop. But one of the things that happens when you pick this, the reason you might not see this in too many grocery stores and some of these other uh, vegetables and fruits that we're talking about, <laughs> is because, excuse me, the leaves will wilt fairly quickly unless you uh, put them in water, but they will actually, uh, to take a cutting, conversely, you can just drop it on the ground and somehow it will start to sprout. As a matter of fact, this will spread where this kind of branches out, reaches out and touches the ground. We have not ever seen it produce flower or any flowers. And that's kind of a good thing because we also need to be careful that we're not starting to plant things in our, in our home gardens or out there for production that are gonna become invasive. That's a whole nother problem. Now, the only time I have ever seen any problem on this plant is when it got overcrowded and it did get some, um, uh, mealy bug problems with it. I just picked them off and um, washed the parts that I picked off and allowed everything to start to regrow again. And that only happened as we were in the, the driest part of uh, the dry season before we were about to launch into um, rainy season. So there's not a lot of documentation from UF on this. However, there is from the University of Hawaii. And also this was a good um, publication on it. And uh, Grower Jim's blog spot, uh, as I said, you will find this all over the internet and saying this will cure everything. I'm not saying that. <laughs> so this one is great too. By the way, hibiscus flowers, true hibiscus, the flowers are edible. Don't eat the stamen, um, the, just the petals is all that you would leave, but you could actually pick those petals and, and include the petals in a salad. Now, I love the cranberry hibiscus. There are two types of hibiscus we can grow here. This one is perennial and you may want to uh, prune it back after it blooms profusely during short days, it's going to produce, see these little seed pods. The flower closes up and it produces these seed pods. The calyx is the part that clasp around the seed pod. And for the other hibiscus, hibiscus sabdorifa, they would harvest those sepals, um, those red plump sepals around the seed pod and they would mash those and bring, uh, a, make a drink out of that. That is an annual and I love that. It's, it's, a, it's a really, it's a, a seasonal uh, holiday drink in the Caribbean. I think you're supposed to add some spirits with it and you, know, you can spice it up with ginger. Um, but the leaves on this are delicious, uh, especially the young tender ones 
Now, I pulled this up from Wikipedia because we don't have a good publication on it. And it says small quantities, mucilaginous. You guys are going to want to look that word up. But trust me, this is not mucilaginous. Maybe if you cook it, but I've never eaten it cooked. I've always eaten it raw with my Chinese spinach. It gives a zing in a salad. Plus, you can add some flowers and you can even throw in some mulberries. Um, it's one of those things you can just make a really interesting um, garden salad out of. But interesting to also note that if you want red food, it retains the colors. So if you want red in your cooked foods, there's lots of ways to eat this. And other parts of the world, will um, they eat different parts of the plant as well. So some herbs, and this again is Asian. This is actually Chinese garlic chives. We can't really grow garlic very well here, but we can grow these garlic chives and they taste like garlic. They first taste like a sweet garlic and then they have the after flavor of a roasted garden garlic, which is really good. Keep in mind, they will also give you bad breath. There's no way to avoid garlic breath. <laughs> they are a little milder. Again, I like them raw, but if you cook them um, or throw them into a, a good stew or something else, I'm getting hungry. I haven't had lunch yet, guys. Um, but uh, they'll add a, a lot of, of flavor and this will grow all year long. They'll flower in the summer. And also a lot of pollinators are attracted to those flowers. Now it said here, says here you can, I just cut some of the blades. I never cut everything, but I cut it from the outside because those are the older leaves and I let the newer leaves that are coming up on the inside continue to uh, grow. And I do have this in uh, one of those grow boxes that someone donated to the extension office so that I could um, so that I can keep it um, in a little richer soil. So this is Cuban oregano or the VIX plant. I, I'm, I couldn't figure out, I used to share this plant with school so often I would just pinch it from my garden here when I was going visiting schools. And I just started to get overwhelmed by the smell of it and that's because it has a similar aroma. This is not a, a real oregano, but this can be used for seasoning. Now, if it's a little too strong in um, the, the fresh, you can dry this and it's a little milder. So drying, you could dehydrate. Um, I'm gonna share some links to different, different ways to preserve uh, foods, or you can simply slow dry it out in the sun and it will grow in just about any soil here directly in the ground. I have it kind of in a partial broken light. It's growing very close to my garlic, as a matter of fact. Easily grown from cuttings. Rosemary. And I don't know what time it is. So somebody, somebody make sure I'm going fast enough so that we have time for questions. But rosemary will grow all year long. And it's one of the oldest herbs, 5000 BC, and it's been used for medicinal and culinary purposes. And it was even in a, a Shakespeare's tale. You need to buy the plant for this. There's no magic way, or you could try growing rosemary from cuttings, but it's a little more difficult. Maybe we'll try some at the extension um, at our shade house just to see if we could get it going. The, the thing to remember with rosemary, make sure you're not putting it any place where it's just going to be inundated when rainy season starts. It likes to stay dry. A lot of people have just overwhelmed this by, with water and that will cause the demise of the plant. Now, there's plenty of references to it as um, commemorative. It's the memory and there, I think this would be fascinating for any of you school um, 
young folks that might be listening in, go back and do some research on it because there, it is believed that there is a trigger due to the fragrance of this um, that that brings up memories. I think if you if you think about it, our first awareness of the world is 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 smell. So that's a very strong relationship. And also, if you take a little piece of a, of the rosemary and rub it, it's cooling. It will actually cool your skin. So some small fruit trees, carambolas, love it. Carambolas will produce three to four times a year, but there is a warning because it is high in oxalic acid that if you have any sort of uh, issues with the function of your kidney, don't consume, maybe don't consume this, check with your doctor. And as a note to, to all of us, don't over consume anything. Remember it was the Greeks, everything in proportion, nothing in, in excess. And you know, when we eat too much of any one thing, it can overwhelm our systems, but it's been grown in Southeast Asia, but it's also been cultivated here in South Florida for over a hundred years. It was one of the first fruits besides bananas and pineapples that we started experimenting with growing here in South Florida. And we can grow so many tropical and subtropical fruits here, but just not apples and peaches and things like that. I'll show you where to find that information in a bit. So this tree, it's a not forever. It will eventually decline and probably fall, but it will be, it can produce many, many years. And there's some really interesting um, cultivars or varieties that don't grow that tall because that's one of the problems um, getting at the fruit. But you can also prune these trees and you'll find that in this publication, when to prune and our tree at the extension it does get um, it does get pruned from time to time. It's just delicious. You can go out there and and grab one of those when you're working in the shade house and juice up. It'll quench your thirst. A lot of people use this sliced. Let me just point one thing out. I almost forgot. It's known as the star fruit because it has a star shape if you cut it lengthwise. However, if you're cutting this to preserve it or to consume it. I prefer to cut it lengthwise and you can avoid this pith in the center. You, you really, you know, that's where any of the seeds and the, the harder uh, parts of the plant that aren't so easy to, to eat are going to be located. And this fruit is just great to cut along that way and freeze the slices and then you can pull out I, I do it all the time when I'm working with kids or when I used to get to work with them face to face, pull it out and you've got an instant frozen fruit pop uh, because it's nice and long. You don't need to do it on a stick, fingers, put them in a bowl, maybe just serve them so that we aren't all touching it. Um, but this also, of course, will, um, it's a good fruit to uh, dehydrate as well. So remember, don't eat too much of it at one time, but you can freeze this perfectly well or dehydrate it to add to salads all year long. Mulberries, yum. And I have lost my mulberry tree here. Um, it made it through hurricane, um, what was that last one we had? Gosh, am I getting old? Not Will, but not Irene. The last hurricane we had about three or four years ago. Oh my goodness, they're all melding into my head. Andrew. Irma, <laughs> Irma, thank you. Thank no you, problem. Megan. And you did a great job. I didn't lose it to the hurricane, but what happened is so much of the elephant grass blew in from that hurricane that it just had a huge clumps of elephant grass growing and we they just had to mow the whole thing down. We're still trying to get elephant grass under control down here. That's an, you know, a, a word of caution back to the invasive things. That was actually um, touted and researched by the University of Florida as a forage plant for, cat, for cattle and it's very invasive. So mulberries, 
and I did include the information here. Um, there's all sorts of cultivars. Now, where you can find this tree, both um, carambola and mulberries are occasionally available with, through adopted tree. That's a Miami-Dade County program that usually begins very late May or June. And it happens at that time of year because that's right before rainy season. Let me point out my chief job is water conservation, that planting anything right now is you're going to have a difficult time because we are in the hardest part of the dry season. Temperatures are hot and we haven't been getting enough rain. And you're gonna to have to be like helicoptering those plants to make sure that they're getting enough water. And when you're planting a tree, if you miss a day or two during a dry spell like we're having right now, it can just set the plant back really badly or even kill it. We all know that you know those those things that you need to do for the tree and for your plants are just as important as what we do with our children to make sure that they grow up as healthy as they can be. So there's lots of cultivars, but adopt a tree would have uh, Morris ruba, which is the native mulberry. It has smaller berries, and some consider it a little tart, but you don't want to pick the berries when they have any red left them. You want to pick them when they're just full and as dark, dark purple as can be, when they'll actually just fall into your hand. And I used to have to uh, kind of fend off the birds to eat my mulberries. They will attract wildlife. If you're a bird watcher, the birds will come for these. And this is one of the, the, the plants that is you know, so this grows in several areas around the world. So a lot of people have started growing some of the cultivars, which are longer. And there's even a white mulberry tree over at the Fruit and Spice Park that's about that long. It's super sweet. It's almost too sweet. But again, you could dehydrate and then use this. Um, I think this is a great fruit to, you know how we all, when we make oatmeal, which is so good for us, we want to put a lot of sugar in it, you know, but you could add the mulberries there and they're excellent frozen and take them out, let them fall out. I love them in uh, cereal and I love them over vanilla ice cream too. Hmm. So papayas, I did add papayas here. This is a tree um, that won't live forever but it will give you papayas it should produce for at least three to four years. There's different cultivars out there. The red ones are highly regarded and don't eat the seeds or the skin on this, but you can buy a papaya in the grocery store that you like and save those seeds and dry those seeds and then plant them. And papayas are well known for, you know, being, you need male or female, but the trees that mostly are used for all the papaya production around the world have a perfect flower. Um, and a perfect flower would contain the male and the female. But most of the time, if you're going to grow one from seed, the, the hard part about the whole thing is that you have all of these seedlings. And I, I showed a photo here so you'll know what they look like because they don't have that distinct papaya leaf shape which is so beautiful but um, you have to wait till it flowers before you can tell if it's male or female and the publication will tell you what to note the females have flowers that grow directly from the trunk the males send out a spray of flowers and you do want to leave some males, of course, because you need cross-pollination. And the interesting thing about this is they're extremely fragrant and the hummingbirds will go to them for nectar. And also the sphinx moths will just come and hover around them at night. One night I was sitting in the yard just observing and there was three or four big sphinx moths and they're as big as hummingbirds. So plants for pollinators, remember, right after clean water we need pollinators to so that that we can have all of these delicious fruits and vegetables to eat 
anything that is grown from a seed or even the plants that we plant from tubers, they were once seeds long ago. They needed a pollinator. So I'm not gonna go real deep into this because I've provided the link here. This is to my favorite website for information on native plants. And Salvia coccinia is a native that will just attract all kinds of pollinators, including hummingbirds. It will grow anywhere in the landscape. Right now, it looks a little tattered. So I've actually um, kind of pulled and shaken the seeds out to let some of mine regrow because it's just incredibly dry out there right now. Um, I'm a little nervous about how dry we're going to get just before rainy season starts. So I'll be watching that and monitoring it. So it's one of the largest uh, plant families with over a thousand species. And you can see here a little caterpillar on there, but it's also the same family as the sage, but Salvia coccinea is not edible. So be very careful when you're looking at those plants, not everything. Some people will say, oh, this is tropical sage, it's edible, but which tropical sage? That is why you always want to look at the scientific name. The, the edible sage is Salvia officinalis, and this is Salvia coccinea. So I'm sure that the, the edible sage produces a flower. In fact, I know it does, but just you can't just rely on other people's words um, because sometimes that knowledge gets a little misconstrued or lost or people forget, like me. So, Barbara, this yes. is Candace. Sorry yes. to interrupt. Uh, it's a one forty-five now, so I'm not okay. sure how much more time well, you have just, for your And I'm almost finished. I'll I'll just all of these. You're you're going to get a um. Oops. I don't think I took that duplicate slide out. You're going to get a PDF. Yeah, there's the duplicate slide that has the links. And this is a great pollinator plant that is also a legume. So it will help fix nitrogen. And actually USDA is doing some research on that and recommending it. So additional resources, I can't stress enough, follow precautions. A lot of you are gonna be first time gardeners out there. And if you're gardening from now on, um, except the mornings are still really cool now, I love it. You're going to be out there in the heat. So this is on our website. Please follow, um, be safe, be smart, work only in the morning, wear a hat, take breaks. I have chairs set up all around my yard where I can sit and re-drink. And uh, if there's any doubt at all about what you're experiencing, call 911. Please read this before you start. So how to preserve? Um, yeah, I'm looking at your comments, guys. <laughs> there's much more I could have uh, included. So this will go through canning, freezing, dehydrating, and some how-tos. Uh, again, extension was was all about canning and preserving foods when it was uh, began over about 110 years ago now. And we, we sprang from the land grant university system. So if the, um, if the uh, nutritional information is not included in any of the links that I gave you, you can go to this link and put in the the plant or the fruit or the vegetable there uh it's a little bit of elongated data sheet but you can find out all of the information you need to know and more information because i only this is the tiny tiny tip of the iceberg on what you can grow and i just tried to pick the easiest ones um more about vegetables and fruits on gardening solutions. Um, this website is just really becoming more and more um, robust and full of information. So one thing you want to go to is all of these, you know, quick start guides, growing your groceries, uh, designing, selecting fertilizers, watering, cover crops, garden safety. I pulled that right off of this website and that's a beautiful garden. 
Um, if you're going to build a raised bed and it's this tightly planted, make sure you don't step in and touch the soil. You can transfer nematodes. So what to grow different times of the year. Here we are in the south and we already talked about quite a few of the things that are in here. And we also have on our website um, how to build an easy raised bed um, right here a whole guide on that. And I just want to point out, you don't need a lot of tools to start with. Remember the hat and remember the gloves. And coming up, there's a blog on if you want to know more about gardening for butterflies. And coming up, we have composting workshop. Composters are free after attending this workshop. This workshop is virtual and you'll be sent a voucher where you can do a safe pickup of a composter and you'll understand all about how to do this. This is partnered with Miami-Dade Library um, System. Our master gardener who's gonna be doing this works for the, for the library system. And I'll be doing uh, rain barrel workshops at the end of the month. And I'll be talking about safe ways to use rainwater for edibles and also how to use it to just grow things in your, in your garden and have available water. I'm, I'm tapping on my rain barrels right now. I planted a rain garden a little early. Our contact information, and there you go. Gardening just doesn't feed you. It does more than feed you. It feeds the soul, your soul as well. So, questions. Thank you so much, Barbara, for that wonderful presentation. I'll now turn it over to Bree. She's going to go ahead and facilitate the Q&A session. And we've received a lot of great comments in the chat. So thank you all thank so you. much. Let me see. Thank I want to see everybody. Oh, sorry. OK, so the first question that I have here um, was submitted in our uh, chat box. So let me go down. It says, my family and I started four garden beds during the pandemic. We're growing collard greens, several herbs, sweet potatoes, okra, etc. We want to grow much more. So everything that you shared in your presentation, can it be grown in Miami? Um, because they've encountered yes. a few yeah. harvest dying or being in. in right, Miami. right. And I saw this question. I think this person also uh, sent a question earlier. Um, yes, all of the resources that I shared are uh, based on our climate down here and you can further explore the things that you can grow here on our website that page where i showed you the link to our web page had easy to grow what grows here we can't grow asparagus or garlic um you know apples peaches pears uh, but there's a whole plethora of other things that we can grow here now i just want to point out one thing for okra Okra is a magnet for nematodes, which are small um, critters in the soil. So plant okra separate from everything else, or they will just pull in those nematodes, which will attack the roots. So you can email me for any, any other questions. I encourage you all, if you can, to visit the fruit and spice part because they've just got a whole bunch of things. They've, they've made it a point to grow everything that we can possibly grow here. So, and please send me an email. So the next question I have here that was submitted by Megan, it says, I'm curious about soil for different plants. I've heard pineapples grow better in more volcanic-like soil, rich in iron, like Hawaii. Yeah, they love that. Hey, everything grows better in Hawaii. They have the world's best soil, come on. <laughs> and they are second only we are, we are second in the number of invasives. <laughs> um, Hawaii tops it all because everything will grow there. But um, pineapples, you might want to plant in a raised bed or some, some way that you can control the soil. Um, there was a question that had been submitted earlier about getting a soil test to see if you have acidic or alkaline soil. And I can, I can answer that for you. We have very alkaline soil here. All of our, all of us do, and that's why we grow. We recommend growing in containers or building a bed, 
Um, and you can get very creative about what you use as a container, anything that's big enough to allow the, the roots to develop to nurture a full mature plant, you can grow it, provide the, the spaces for the water to seep through. But um, that's why we create our concoctions of soil to grow these edible vegetables in. Now, a lot of the ones that I talked about, the fruit trees, you don't need to do anything special for. Um, you follow the fertilization recommendations, but a lot of times I can tell you at the extension office that the things don't get fertilized there and, and they, they grow just fine. So there's no irrigation and, and no fertilizer put on them and they're doing fine. So. Um, Thank you. I the saw that. I saw that pop up. <laughs> yeah. The so, next question here, we have here is, what can I do about lizards that are eating my plants and even white flies? Oh, yeah. We talked about this beforehand. Um, iguanas will eat anything and everything out there. And I hope it's not iguanas. Um, because they're they're hard to to deal with. Um, you really have to kind of try to fence them out. Um, and iguanas always need a source of water, so this would be someone who's living near a canal or a lake. Um, and we get a lot of those calls. Um, we have a publication. Oh gosh, I should have shared that with you earlier. It's on our Edis website. And I can share that with you to send out with the PDF. There's one garden club that I do presentations for. Every time I do a presentation, they ask me about iguanas again. I'm sorry. Um, you know, I will tell you that the female iguana lays her eggs and then leaves. So if you observe them making a nest and laying their eggs, you can go and collect the eggs and destroy them um, before they they hatch. And baby iguanas are so cute. They're bright green. Um, the iguanas that we have problems with here came from the pet trade of people buying them and not realizing they were going to get this big. <laughs> so, um, as we, we have with a lot of, you know, the Burmese pythons, same issue. Um, they're exotic, invasive, and, you know, anything that you attempt to uh, control, you have to be humane in how you do it. That is required by law, and the best thing I can say is we'll, we'll share the publication with you. Thank goodness you don't have peacocks to deal with because they're the same kind of problem as well. So... <laughs> And with peacocks, if you move the eggs, they will just lay more. So some things with iguanas, you can remove the eggs and hopefully the population will get smaller. Awesome, thank you so much. A common theme in a lot of the questions that were submitted previously was how to safely deal with unwanted pests, whether indoor or outdoors, especially when dealing with vegetables or fruit, something that is safe but also deals with that. So if you have any information, that'd be great to share. Yes, Brianna, I'm so glad you asked that question while everyone is still here because um, when some insects and pests are going to require the use of chemicals and before you ever do that, just like um, before you take start taking anything for if you're sick, you know, the doctor wants to know what's wrong with you and then he'll prescribe. So what we want to do is we want to identify the pest for you, take a photo, send us an email. We will let you know what it is. And if it's a, a cultural issue, like you're watering too much that or you have the plants that are overcrowded. And we'll also let you know this is just a seasonal insect that pops up. It's going to go away um, and be be very careful of using alternative products that are derived from natural um, materials because it's the chemicals in them that um, that causes them to kill. So anything that ends with pesticide, insecticide, herbicide, CIDE, you need to be very careful with how you're using that, no matter what it's derived from, natural or by you know, a big chemical company that produces billions of gallons of it. 
um, we still need to be very aware. And do we really need to use it? Is there another way to deal with it? Or for instance, I had the little luber grasshoppers, nothing will kill them except squishing them. Yikes. Um, and you could spray anything on them, it won't harm them. So we want to identify it before we have all of this use of, of chemicals. Remember what Florida Friendly Landscaping is all about, is learning what to plant so we don't use so much water and what insects are really going to be harmful. Most of the time insects will police themselves, they'll control each other. Fortunately, with luber grasshoppers, nothing eats them and nothing will kill them. So they're an exception and they're not native. So there again. So I hope that in a nutshell, contact us and we'll research it for you. I won't give you off the top of my head. I will go back in and find the publication for you and, um, and share it and share that information with you. So we can take care of the environment healthy environment too. Awesome, thank you so much. For the sake of time, we're actually going to stop our Q&A session. Um, we did write down all of the questions that have been submitted in the chat and also the ones that have been submitted when you guys were all registering. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna send a follow-up email that includes the presentation and additional information from those questions. Um, I wanna thank everyone who submitted questions. And so I'm really quick, I'm just gonna hand it over to Candice to close this out for the day. Thank you so much, Bree and Barbara. That was really good and very insightful for some of those situations that are happening in the garden. Um, so today, as a reminder, um, as a part of the Florida Department of Health here in Miami-Dade County, the Office of Community Health and Planning, this is our Healthy Happens Here webinar series. And I did go ahead and share in the chat box already for our next upcoming event, which will be on Thursday, April 15th at 2 p.m. And please join us. We'll be talking about ending the HIV and STD epidemic. And also please stay tuned for other future announcements for May and June. And finally, please make sure to visit us at healthymiamiday.org to receive the latest updates from the Consortium for a Healthier Miami-Dade. And we will also um, share in the chat the evaluation um, just to share with us your feedback for future ideas and also about this topic today. So again, thank you all so much for joining us today and we hope you have a great rest of the day. You guys are going to copy the questions and just send them to me. Yes, and then just as a reminder, this was uh, recorded and we will go Perfect. ahead and share this um, through the consortium website on our YouTube page. All right, excellent. I'll be answering those questions for the rest of the day, <laughs> right after lunch. Bye everyone. Have a great day.